Do natural history museums present the truth about origins? Watch our Genesis Impact movie to see a young Christian successfully challenge a museum docent on the leading evidences for evolution. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. Oh, okay, everybody. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Christina. Christina. Hey, Christina, I think all these folks really want to get to the exhibits that they all paid to come and see. I'm not stopping anybody. I simply had some questions I was hoping you could help me with. Let me guess. You have more. Yes. So one of the many things that religious believers love to do, to my experience, is to project all their own faults onto the opposition. Though, and they know that faith is indefensible, so they have to dis they they have to assume that we are the ones who have faith, or that it's the two quo qui fallacy, where yeah, uh, so also you, or you're just as bad, right? So they want to, so they have to create this illusion where the do the museum docent is defending a belief in evolutionism, and so when when the docent is ill equipped to uh, to address that, he. Um, He's going to be hesitant and, and, and shy, and, and, and he's going to try to hustle everybody out, you know, like there's nothing to see here, that sort of thing. That's what a religious believer does. But if you, if you don't have a belief system, you're literally not going to defend the faith. You're going to ask for the evidence sufficient to convince you. And this is, this is where we argue all the time where the believers just fall flat on their face. We, uh, I, hey, I'm. They, they will tell me that uh, you can't change my mind, and I'm not going to change yours. Well, the problem is you could change my mind if you had something. So I, I don't, I don't have a belief system. I don't have a faith. I'm not, I'm not determined to keep believing something no matter what. If you can show me, and I'll believe it in a moment. Just, but show me the good reason first. And they don't have one. They're just, they, 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 they believe because they want to. And yeah, I well, don't want to. I don't want to make believe. I mean, it, Ken Ham does this still. Like, I, th and that's interesting because Ken Ham is like AIG, and these guys are Genesis apologetics. So this is like a unilateral across the young Earth creationism sphere. You know, they they have to denigrate science to being on the same level as a belief system to being a religion. Hence the ism that they always slap at the end of it, uh, because that puts it in their mind, like on the same playing field where, you know, it's two, two Titans duking it out. And it's like, no, that's, that's not how this functions. Right. I mean, you don't even investigate these two, like theology and all of those errors are investigated using a completely different set of, of, um, of parameters as opposed to like the scientific method, because you're right. It's not doctrine. The point is that you can be proven wrong if there's sufficient data. That's, and I, I, this is like the, the tagline that I like to apply to it, right? But it's like the mutability of science is its greatest strength. It is adaptive, right? It's it's able to accommodate new information and change with it. Uh, that's a good thing. But yeah, like this whole this whole thing, you know, they paint the the museum docent here is like, oh, he's on the defensive. He's so he's so meek and and trying desperately to hold on in, in the face of this brave young student who, by the way, can't pronounce Australopithecus, as we'll see later in this video. And he doesn't correct her because, of course, he's not a museum docent, right? He's he's a preacher. Um, because they never want to have these conversations with actual folks in the field. Like it's not that they can't get the attention. They don't want the attention because if the spotlight comes over to them, they get they get exposed for some of the stuff that they're saying, which, as we've shown in the, the rest of this series, a lot of it is just brutally incorrect in a way that can be shown by like Google Scholar cursory searches, which they don't bother to do. Um, so it, it's 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 an illusion of wanting a debate. It's an illusion of wanting to find answers when in reality it, it's it's all a facade. At least as far as I've seen interacting with young earth creationists, and like I feel like I've got a decent amount of experience with that, and I know you do. <laughs> I gave testimony to the Texas State Board of Education one time in defense of of teaching evolution in public schools, and there was one of the creationist groups there was some kid who looked like he it was the very first time he'd ever worn a suit, and it was clearly not his own. But it, it was it, it was the way he mispronounced some of the scientific terms. Like, see if you can recognize this one. What I heard when he spoke was the initials R K O, and then the words pet tricks. R K O pet tricks. Oh, Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Material submitted by many publishers fails 
fail to outline methods for critical scientific evaluation of Darwinian evolution and other scientific theories. Many of the core Darwinian constructs are presented as facts rather than scientific findings that students should critically review. These include, but are not limited to, the explanation of the tree of life, the Miller-Urey experiments, and the transitional fossil record and ar 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 archaeopetrix. <laughs> We move on from Lucy. The next in the line for human evolution is Homo habilis, correct? Yes. Well, actually, no. And the way that they're contextualizing this next in the line would be Kenyan Thropus platyops, right? I mean, the way I mean, that they're depicting this in a linear kind of a scale. Yeah, I mean, because because what they're doing is they don't treat it like they're trying to treat it like an antigenetic march of progress, like where it's like this thing turns into this, like Pokemon evolution, right? Like this thing yeah. becomes this thing, which becomes this thing. And every time something becomes something else, the previous population instantly goes extinct, right? Like that's how they treat this. That's not how it works. That's not how it works today. That's not how it works in the past. That's not even how Darwin proposed it works. No one has ever said this, right? Like even in regular <laughs> anagenesis, no one proposes that the previous group goes extinct once the next group comes along. It's just not typically how it works. The habit of this stuff is really is weird. And I knew it was weird in Contested Bones, this little number here, which is the book that they pull from as evidenced by the vernacular that they use and the arguments that they use. And this section of Homo habilis is very strange because of the sources that it utilizes. They're like from, I kid you not, they're from the 30s, the 1930s, a lot of the sources. So I was like, okay, it's been a long time since I've read those. I might, maybe I should pre-watch this just so I know I'm up to date on, on what's being said. And interestingly enough, the arguments that they make in this video, first of all, they're, they don't source them. They, they are not sourced. The way that I found the sources for the, the things that they're saying in this, uh, in this section of their video, their little documentary, was I had to go to the Genesis Apologetics article that corresponds to Homo habilis in order to find out where they're pulling this from. And it is also from the 1930s, but it is a different thing from the 1930s. So I had to read that, and then I had to actually read the up-to-date literature on the site, um, which is uh, at Hyrax Hill, to see what we actually think about this site now, at present. Because I don't know if you know this, but radiometric dating and radiocarbon dating has come a long way since the 1930s. And as you'll see, some of the stuff that they say about the, the site in question, first of all, some of the stuff that they say is, is incorrect. And then second of all, some of the stuff they say is misrepresentation. And then third, some of it is misuse. And then fourth, some of it is also wrong. So like, because it's out of date. What they like to do here is they like to take the, the fossil record and Mind you, it's not the full fossil record. They like to, to take the fossil record as we understood it in the 1970s and argue with that fossil record in an antigenetic fashion, all of which is inappropriate. So the way that they're doing this is they're taking kind of um, basal forms and then trying to put them one after the other, again, in a linear fashion to modern forms. So if they're doing it that way, as you said, then yeah, Kenyanthropus platyops would come next because it's got a larger brain case size. It's got a more um, uh, orthognathic face than Australopithecus, which came before. And it fits quite snugly in a lot of those characteristics between late Australopithecus and early genus Homo. But even more than that, you also have to fit in the derived, act the derived aspects, excuse me, of Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus sediba. And it depends on how you're arranging them, because if you're doing it morphologically versus doing it by time, it's going to be a different, it's going to hash out differently. Morphologically speaking, Homo naledi and Homo floresiensis are both going to fit roughly in between like early genus Homo, late Australopithecus with brain case size and aspects of the morphology of the face, even though some other aspects would place them as more derived. Um, but they lived like 250,000 years ago to like 30,000 years ago, depending on which hominin we're looking at. So you have to consider this in the way that actual paleoanthropologists, actual evolutionary biologists consider it, or else it doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, these guys don't consider it in that fashion, and then they complain that none of it makes any sense. Um, but so yeah, I got so the comment, I got the comment today from a, a, a Christian who saw me on some talk show with an incredibly stupid host uh, arguing about you know, that you, you wrote a book said all humans are apes. <laughs> you ever seen an ape turn into a human? That show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that, that was, that was, 
bizarrely stupid. But anyway, this one believer from watched that show and then sent me an email reaching out to me to share his truth, which is nothing mm -hmm. but a bunch of lies. And he said that if we came from apes, then why, why are there still apes? And so I have to explain to him Classic. how how this actually happens. And, and I told him to Google the phrase, if we came from apes, why are there still apes? Just to notice mm -hmm. that it, it is the, it's the poster child of stupid questions that anybody who knew anything at all about evolution would not ask anything so dumb. Well, they've been asking it since like the 40s, right? I mean, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? It's like a Scopes monkey trial kind of question. And, you know, the, the answer to that is like, okay, if dogs came from wolves, why are there still wolves? If you came from your grandparents, why are your grandparents still alive? Like it, it none of it makes any sense if you give it even the most modicum of, of thought. And like some of these folks are, were credit as due, right? Some of these folks are asking the question genuinely. A lot of them aren't, right? A lot of them are using it as like a, 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 a attempted a gotcha because that's all of all this really is, is it's about rhetoric. Uh, and I've experienced that a lot recently with the Jeffrey Tompkins video that I released, right? Like, I've here I am, I've tested his methods, I've done it his way to see what you get when you expand the analysis. And I'm having creationists come into my comment section and say, oh, it's just a difference in philosophy. And I'm like, it's not, a. am testing his it's method. It's math. It's math. <laughs> his numbers are showing a person as 84% similar to themselves. It is, it is, absolutely nonsensical and they respond to that and say you know something along the lines of well we're just gonna have to agree to disagree so the example what i gave this guy he, i figured this is how you how you could understand evolution you know, we had the initial concept of christianity emerge and then right away it divides into orthodox and catholics and then within the catholics you have one guy that decides no i'm not going to follow you anymore i'm going to make protestantism and now we have this new offshoot and we still have catholics protestants come from catholics why are there still catholics and then the protestants beget the the the, the, the baptists along with a whole bunch of other groups then within baptists you end up with southern baptists and a bunch of different groups so these are how this is how evolution happens it was yeah, the best it's, illustration I could give to the guy at the, for something he I thought he might understand. Yeah, well, it's the same for languages, right? I mean, like you you have all of that's these my languages. favorite example. Yeah, because you can you can track it in real time, right? You can you can see different dialects emerge now, even which, but but the point isn't necessarily to understand. I don't think for some of these folks, right? Like, and that sucks. You are that so sucks. generous. I, I I'm just I'm just saying, Aaron. I'm just saying, right? Like. I, I consider myself cynical compared to how I was three years ago when I first started doing this online, which was like benefit of the doubt. I'm giving out benefit of the doubt like Oprah gives cars away, right? But like the more you interact with some of these folks, the more the more it becomes evident that it's not about finding the truth. It's about giving the illusion that that's what it's about. And that sucks. That sucks so much. That sucks. And then it's like, you know, well, why do you bother with all this stuff? And it's because there is a fraction, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a fraction that are actually trying to figure out what's going on. That's who it's for. Um, and unfortunately, my perspective of like that ratio, good faith to bad faith, it skews a little more every year. And that also sucks. Okay. How many complete Homo habilis creatures have they found? Like, a few hundred skeletons? No, not that many. I'm guessing a dozen skeletons? Actually, they haven't found any. So, do you understand, like, do they understand the double standard that they use, right? Where it's like, finding a full skeleton, like, every single piece, no chips, no degradation, nothing like that is what's necessary for human evolution. But they will gladly accept every dinosaur, every Cenozoic mammal, excluding the hominids that, that comes out um, as perfectly legitimate, right? It's all, you only need the full skeleton when it's hominins we're talking about. Um, but moreover, isn't it interesting that now they want to talk about how many skeletons, how many specimens we have of Homo habilis, when for Australopithecus afarensis, it's just Lucy. That's it, despite the fact that we have the remains of 300 to 400 individuals for that hominin. 
varying quality, but as far as like partial skeletons, around a dozen, something of that nature, especially for the genus, that number shoots up. But for Homo habilis, now we want to talk about the number of, of specimens. It's it's such a bait and switch. It's so frustrating. You know, as as far as partial skeletons go as well, I think it's important to point something out with regard to where we're at in hominid evolution in general and why I would propose having the full postcrania for Homo habilis as nice as that would be isn't as necessary as it was for Australopithecus, which came before. And the reason for that is because the postcrania doesn't do that much changing compared to the craniofacial um, morphology once we reach late Australopithecus, early genus Homo. By the time you reach Australopithecus afarensis, all those Australopithecus are bipedal on the ground, which means restructuring that's going on that's that's pivotal for understanding like how humans have changed, how, how hominins have changed over time has become less important, less important postcranially than cranially, right? Because as we said last time, bipedalism evolves first. So you're you're a sort of ape-faced, as it were, a biped rather than a big-brained ape, as it were, in, in the trees. And so what's really important is going to be the skulls for things like Homo habilis and things that they lump into Homo habilis, or at least don't deign to mention, like Homo rudolfensis. And we've got lots of skulls between the two of these species, like over half a dozen remarkably com complete crania. Um, and they're united by morphologies, right? Uh, enough that we can actually tell the difference between Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, the minutia of the dentition, the minutia of the face, the minutia of the brain case, uh, shape and size. So the, the skulls are going to be what's more important here, but that also doesn't mean that we don't have any post crania for Homo habilis. We do to the degree that like we can compare how Homo habilis looked at given localities, because it does differ a little bit. So, I mean, it, this whole the whole point here is to to kind of um, to kind of get yeah, like I said earlier, like it's like a bait and switch, right? Like they're willing to talk about the the skeleton number here where they weren't with Australopithecus. Um, well, let me put it another way. I mean, back in the day when Darwin predicted that there should be these intermediates. And you know, the creationists are always still to this day saying, well, they ain't never found the missing link. But yeah, they did. So yeah. Darwin predicted that that because it, chimpanzees and bonobos were, were, were so ready, so close to us, that there would be no reason that anything should be halfway between us and them unless and only if evolution is true. That's the only reason you would ever find anything that was morphologically halfway that it was you know less prognathic that it was bipedal whatever you know, you know any of these di these different these uh similarities or shared traits any one of them alone would have been enough to say no that there's there's a, virtually no division anywhere there's no way that you can go by the old standard where they arbitrarily created you know pongo to to put in all the apes except us right and then make a separate category uh, so, so Darwin predicted there would be this intermediate form, and they find that intermediate form. As a matter of fact, they find a bunch of them, not just a bunch for that one form, but they find a bunch of other forms. So you have something that is halfway between humans and apes, or what we recognize as apes, the apes that were known at the time, being chimpanzees and bonobos specifically, talking about those apes and not all the others. Yes, the answer to the yes or no question, do we have an intermediate between those? Yes. It doesn't come down to, do we have 400 full skeletons do we have 400 individuals yes do we have do we have an individual we shouldn't have one there shouldn't be there should be none if creationism was true there wouldn't be one but we got it and then do we have an intermediate between that and apes well yes we do we've got you know the the, the other australopiths we have the paranthropines we have we have uh artipithecus for example you know, um, a couple of Aurora, them. And then, Salanthropus. You've got Homo, you've got Aurora and Chicanensis, Salanthropus Chinensis. You have, in, uh, you know, going backwards, going forwards in between Australopiths and humans, you've got Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo georgicus, Homo ergaster. Kenyanthropus. Yeah, Kenyanthropus. Yeah, you, you've you got more than you know what to do with. It's still not, like, I, I would love, and for those of you out there who are creationists, what would an ape man look like? Right? Can you describe what a transitional species would look like between humans and the, you know, our, our, our ancient Miocene ape and not describe what are the hominins that we have? Can it be done? It can't. I, and this is exactly why they used to describe it. 
They used to say, where's the ape man? Where's the halfway, half man, half ape, whatever. They don't use that argument anymore because we have too many. <laughs> so I asked that question of Ray Comfort. Because yeah, he say? says there's no transitional species. It doesn't matter that we have like, what, 30 different species that fall into the classification that they're talking about or that they used to talk about when they said, show me your ape man. We've got 30 different species of the things now. And they're they're all intermediate to each other as well from, from apes to, to humans. Yeah. So we have, what, 30 intermediaries there? No, that, that wasn't good enough. So I asked him in, in this debate that we were having on, on a radio show, I said, so... What traits would you look for to identify whether something is intermediate between humans and apes? What traits would you look for? And he said, oh, I wouldn't, because I would know that I'm a child of God. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't look. Yeah, That's the I admission I was looking for. You're never going to admit anything. You know what the truth is, but you've made $4 million by lying professionally, and now you live in a two-story house on the beach in Malibu. Mm. That's what this is about. And the only way you, you you would never have been able to do that by being a used car salesman, well, which would be the only thing you're skilled at other than this. Well, and they can't put up they can't put up expectations anymore because when they used to put up expectations, the expectations kept being met. Where's the transitional, you know, between Pachycetus and modern whales, you know, and then you you come out with Dorodon or Basilosaurus or whatever. I mean, where where's the transitionals between Eustenopteron and Tiktaalik, or from between Tiktaalik and Acanthostega, and you're coming out with Ichthyostega and Tularpeton and all these other guys, and and then they ask for you know for the hominins, like where's the transition, and you just give them gobs and gobs and gobs and gobs and gobs, and now they keep, they've stopped putting out expectations. Because the expectations are met, right? We, we find what we're looking for to the extent that it's hard to draw a line between <laughs> Australopithecus anamensis and Australopithecus afarensis, right? Like it's hard to distinguish some of the specimens between these guys because they're so transitional. Um, but one one so, of the ones they used to bring up to me 20 years ago, they said they're never going to find a fossil with a half a wing because what good is a half a wing? Well, and now we have... Now we have fossils of, of uh, oviraptors using their half wings to cover a clutch of eggs to better insulate them. Well, look at look at all these half wings we got. Look at all the velociraptors. Look at my pet emu. <laughs> you got podsterics. You got the Piosaurus. I mean, they there was an experiment done just. I'm like this. This is what blows my mind, right? Like they're they they complain about how do you get feathers from scales? Chickens have both. They have both of them. And they're developmentally from the same epithelial cells, right? It's the same guy. You can get proto feathers by tweaking genes in crocodiles. Like I just, it, it's so simple. It's such a simple prediction that's come to fruition. Um, but they can't create these expectations because then we could test them. And then they would have to admit that they were wrong, which they can't do. Um, that's, that's the last thing that can be done here. And yeah. it's, it's I did really an expose. Uh, they had this guy Minton who was a, some kind of an oh, I know Minton. Was, yeah, David Minton. He only recently passed away of COVID, I believe. Yeah, he was. Uh, oh, but COVID's not a real thing either. So, <laughs> according to these people, but Min Minton gave this presentation about how dinosaurs cannot be related to birds. Birds cannot be dinosaurs, right? And I did a, I think a 10 part expose on that showing where he, he had, he had knowingly lied, misrepresented the data on every single point that he had made until right at the end, he finally contradicted his own previous declarations where he said that dromaeosaurs could not possibly be related to birds because of, you know, of these. Well, now, now that he knows that they have feathers and there's nothing else he can say, he now says that. Dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor and all that, all the, all the, almost all of the Peruvian dinosaurs are just now, they're now birds. Yeah. It oh, doesn't yeah. matter the teeth. It doesn't matter the claws. It doesn't matter the full tail, all of that. If, if the Velociraptors are birds now, where he, he said previously that they cannot be, then he's just contradicting himself. He is, he's just, how, how else can you put it? It's just an obvious obfuscation. He, they cannot admit that they are wrong, so they have to make up a new lie to cover that up. Well, Prothero talked about it in, in his books and, and talked about his encounters with Dwayne Gish and the evolution of, of um, Triceratops-like dinosaurs, Ceratopsians, that's where I'm looking for, Ceratopsians, um, and how you know, he went to Gish's presentations and saw him say, oh, and there's no 
evolution in ceratopsians. And then he debated Gish, presented the evolution of ceratopsians. And the next speaking arrangement that Gish had, he's saying the same thing that he's always said. Like, it just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And that's the part, again, that sucks. Like, it it, it makes you feel, and like, I, I mean, I, I know I, I sent you like my Tompkins video, right? But like, I've got that fresh on my mind because like, here I am, I'm testing this guy's methods. I watched I, that entire two hour presentation that you did, by the way. I'm glad. I hope you enjoyed it because it took a long time and it took a I lot did. of experimentation. But um, I don't know with some of these guys. Like, is it incompetence? I don't know with Tompkins. Is it deceit? It is for some right? How can you look at Gish's presentation as presented by Prothero and, and not come to the conclusion that it's deceit, right? He's had the information presented to him and that's documented. And he's still saying the same thing with no counter argument, right? Not saying, hey, I've heard the evidence. I wasn't convinced, but not even acknowledging it. And that's what, what Gen Genesis Impact, this movie that we're watching, continues to do. They don't even acknowledge the things that they're disagreeing with. Here we're talking about Habilis, no mention of Rudolfensis, no mention of Kenyanthropus platyops, no mention of any of the other Australopithecus that are incredibly similar to the degree that we got We got a paper, I think I said it was by Bernard Wood last time we spoke, but it's actually by Bill Kimball, um, Australopithecus to Homo, the transition that wasn't because it's so smooth, right? At, but they don't mention any of this stuff because it's hard to deal with the evidence and they don't like things that are hard. <laughs> because faith means making believe things that are not evidently true. In in this case, like that's the only conclusion that, that I can draw, right? Like for, for these guys here, it's not about actually dealing with the evidence. It's about reassuring the, the flock here that they don't need to look at it. It's about saying, nah, don't pay no mind to the man behind the curtain, right? Like we're, we're good. It's fine. Look, we're dealing with the evidence. And it's like, well, then why'd you pay an actor to pretend to be an anthropologist? <laughs> <laughs> You're losing me here. They haven't found any? Well, of course they found fossil pieces. Fewer than 100 they believe belong to Homo habilis, but they haven't found any complete creatures. <laughs> okay, so this creature is shown in complete form, even with human-looking eyes, with eye whites, in museums around the world. They haven't found any complete creatures? The what is a creature? What is a creature? A creature is something that was created, right? Is that a term that scientists would use in a museum? Creature? Organism. Organism. That's what we'd use. <laughs> we'd use organism. But they, but they have to say creature because they got mowed down so hard for saying, you know, humans and for saying uh, um, that we evolved from, from apes because it's like, yeah, because we're yeah we're still apes like uh, they got busted so now they're like an ape-like creature which i guess sure um but they they complain about the eye whites we talked about this in the last episode there are so many examples of extant non-human hominids with white sclera it's insane right so yes it is in fact reasonable to present a lot of these hominids with having white sclera because one we know that they're communal living right they they're living on the ground in groups as most apes do today and as hominins have done in the past. So gaze following is presumably quite important. You can also use the molecular clock for certain genes and finding out when they show up or, or disappear, but it's also just a part of the normal variation. But for them, it has to be deceit, right? Like, oh, they're doing it on purpose to try to make them look more human as if the inline big toe, bipedal stance, big brains, flat faces, human-like teeth wasn't a, enough of a sell. Um, you know, this thing what is the motivation? This is the one, one that brings me up. Whenever I get accused of this, you know, this evolutionist fraud thing, we know that everything about creationism is frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies, and that's it. There's no truth to it, but there's a hell of a lot of lies in all of it. That's that's all it is is a hell of a lot of lies. But what it and so the motivation for them is that they get to make believe that they are that, that they don't they don't understand that they, that it's a false dichotomy to say that you you have to reject evolution in order to believe in God. They don't understand that, that there are people who understand and accept evolution who also believe in God. Oh, yeah. right? they, they don't they don't get any of that. So they, they think it's got to be all or nothing because they're entirely binary. They have to be, they either have to reject science to to believe in magic or they, they, they can't integrate both, right? So it's well, got to be one or the other. It's for the exceptionalism. But, 
so so from their perspective, they have to have their their magic book of fables that we know are wrong, and so do they. But they have to make believe in these fables, even the parts that they know for certain are not true, like talking snakes, for example, and 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 you know, well, all of the rest of it. They have to do this illusion so that, as as Ken Ham put it, if you don't believe in in you know, what the Bible says in Genesis, then how are you going to believe in what it talks about? If, it, if you don't believe what it says about creation, then how can you believe what it says about salvation? So that's that's the game. You have to make believe in the first part in order to make believe in the second part. That's, that's what and, they draw. And so it, they, want, they want to believe that they are best friends with the most powerful being imaginable and that they will not really die. So that's what the old, whole issue is. They can't understand how things die and stop being things. So they want to, they want to exist forever. And that's the big make believe. They want to believe that there's a purpose that they have this fixation with purpose, I don't, which I don't understand myself. They they want to, they, their humility is such that they think that they're the reason the universe exists, that that everything was created just for us. Right? That's and what so I that, yeah. That's that's where I think it's coming. I think it's coming from the human exceptionalism, right? The desire to be the center of it all and step apart from the rest of nature, and like the idea of being just another animal is like offensive to them and like i don't understand why either like i don't get it i i find that to be incredibly beautiful and romantic the unity with the rest of the tree of life and the the you know the the hero's journey that is human evolution in many ways the buddhist concept of being one with everything look at taxonomy there you are yeah oh yeah it, it one we one are a part of nature not apart from it yeah, it's it's well, it's one with everything horizontally. So like with our unity with everything that is alive now and temporally, like through time, you can draw, you can see the emergence of what we are in the fossil record, right? That's incredible. That's fast. We're so lucky to be able to be a part of this and to be able to see that emergence through time. I mean, it's it's incredible in, in my opinion, but they don't like that because it also, in my opinion, uh, ruins their justification for absolutely annihilating the rest of, of the earth for their own gain, right? For, for destroying ecosystems for human convenience. Yeah, which so, is so their motivation... So we, we know what they have to believe. They have to make believe this thing that they know is not true in order to make believe this other thing that, you know, where they can promise themselves impossible nonsense beyond death, right? Um, but what is our motivation? What is what is our motivation? We don't have, because for them, they have to believe. They have this requirement, you have to believe. You cannot please God unless you believe in God. You got to believe in God. You got you to gotta believe in hell. You got to believe in all. So they, they, that's that's their motivation. We, what's ours? Why would we lie like they do? If we had any idea, if we had the notion that there was really a God and that evolution wasn't real, why, why would we lie about it? I mean, I know what they say, right? Like they, they think it's all about removing and it, the, none of this makes any sense because there's so many religious people who accept evolution, but to them, they're like, oh, first you come for Genesis and then they're trans and the kids in schools and, and taking away our guns and, you know, not letting us drill for oil. Like that's the, that's their slippery slope fallacy. That's what you see. The only on thing that AIG, it, it, it right? can't be because we want to sin because if, I, yeah. if if there was such a thing as sin if i loved sin i'd be a christian and sin all the time you know once well, saved always saved you know that well, that's the thing but but we know that the only thing that really pisses god off the only sin that cannot be forgiven is the sin of disbelief so if you want to guarantee a place in hell pretend that you don't believe in god blaspheme the holy spirit so if we really believed that there was any indication at all that that creationism was true we would not have any motivation to lie about it. Like well, they do have a motivation to lie about their side. Well, and it's certainly not financial. I mean, Joel Osteen makes quite a bit more money than any paleoanthropologist ever. So it's it's not financial. What? Why? Like you said, why? And as I would like to bring up in sort of the opposite direction, right? Why would we lie about the age of the earth? And then it's like, 
Well, radiometric dating is critical for basin modeling, which is critical for fossil fuel exploration. If there's one thing oil barons love more than being conservative, it's money. They wouldn't use radiometric dating if it didn't work. And yet they all do in order to line their pockets, right? Because that's what works. That's how you find oil. You know about Zion oil? I think I've told you about Zion oil. I don't think you have. Yeah, it's an oil <laughs> it's an oil company, a fossil fuel exploration company that doesn't use old earth presumptions to find oil. They're bankrupt. <laughs> they have no money. <laughs> <laughs> they have no money. They don't find oil. Their stock is like, it, they still have stock of evidently that you can purchase. And of course they're called Zion oil. Uh, but yeah, they, they don't find fossil fuels because they, Do they don't use divining oil. rods. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I genuinely think I had an argument, or, you know, I, I had a sort of exchange with a, a creationist, one of the ones over at Standing for Truth, actually, uh, I think it was David McLean, one of their geologists. And he's like, you don't have to use radiometric dating. You can just dig in a lot of places and eventually hit oil. And it's like, OK, sure. That's why all of the oil barons use that method. Shots fired in the dark into the ground to find oil. Instead that, of radiometric that's how Jeb Clampett found it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what is the best shot for Homo habilis? The most defining fossil set. Are there enough bones from the same creature to recreate it as they do in the museums? Well, they've never found even a partially complete habilis skeleton, but they do have up to 100 bone pieces categorized in this species and a few partial skulls. Some incorrect stuff going on here, right? We do have partial skeletons. They're just not in articulation, right? Like we have skeletons similar to Lucy, the specimen, right? Where they're found in, the, in an area together and they can create, um, they, they form a full, in, not a full individual, but the, the majority of an individual. They'll talk in a moment about the holotype OH7 for Homo habilis, but that certainly isn't the only one. And then they just offhandedly talk about, oh, we have a few skulls. That's of enormous importance here because most of the changes moving forward from Australopithecus through Homo all the way up to Homo sapiens are craniofacial. So the fact that we have a few skulls is a massive point that they just completely skip over, right? I mean, I've got a, a 3D printed one of, uh, of um, 1813, Canem 1813 right here, right? This is an individual who, as we talked about last time, has a brain case that is within the Australopith range, but the face is remarkably derived in many ways, right? A more gracile brow ridge. We have the, the, um, uh, protrus eh, the protrusion. The nasal bone sticks out a little bit more. It's got a more parabolic palate. The teeth are more derived. But everything related to the postcrania that we can tell from the skull, which primarily comes from the foramen magnums, the orientation and angle of the, the hole at the base of the skull, Tells us that this thing's bipedal. Of course it is. It's it's carrying over from the Australopithecus that came before. But we don't just have to infer that from the skull because we also have feet from Homo habilis with the inline big toe. We have the hands that show an intermediate precision grip in between later genus Homo and Australopithecus that came before. But to them, none of that matters, right? Like I have a book here called uh, From Lucy to Language. This thing was published like well over a decade and, and a half ago. And if you go to their homo habilis section, you can just flip through skull after skull, post crania after post crania and look for yourself at what we actually have here. We've got the type specimen. So they're showing here the mandible from OH7. You can just scroll through skulls one after the other, after the other high quality skulls and, and it looks like some detailed explanations for each one as well of course they talk about the locality where they're found the strata that they were found in right what they're radiometrically dated to and none of this is going to be appreciated here and this is something that creationists also don't seem to understand it's not just individuals that are mosaics right it's not just lucy is a mosaic her bones are also mosaic in and of themselves, right? The head of the femur itself is mosaic. It's not even just the femur itself, aspects of it are transitional. Artipithecus ramidus that we talked about a few days ago, the pelvis, the top portion of the pelvis, which is intact with the bottom portion of the pelvis, so the ilium versus the ischium. The ilium is derived and the ischium is basal, right? The bone itself is transitional. So the species are transitional and the bones are transitional. Therefore, you don't have to find a completely articulated individual to know whether or not 
it sits as a tra you know, transitional form looking backwards. Importantly, I think you mentioned the parabolic palate. Yeah. So with with chimpanzees, for example, the, the, their palate is rather flat. And so they don't have the ability to make the noises that we do that we call talking. And the, and the difference between them and us is that tiny little gap above the tongue where, yeah. that we can use to, to fluctuate our tongue to make noise, to make articulate sounds and different kinds of sounds, vowels and such. So that's what enables speech. That and the palate is... Gap. The palate is also important because by by shifting the canines for like by reducing the canines, we can shift them forward into the, you know, not quite, but up in line, sort of in the incisal row to the side. You get rid of the diastema, you can shrink the teeth in general and make room for a small like you shrink the face, you shrink the jaws, you shrink the teeth, bigger brain. Right. All of this is about in part making room um, for for a massive neocortex. Of course it is, right? Like it's not a coincidence that right before we see the explosion in brain case size, we see the emergence of the most basal tools in the fossil record, the Lamequi tools at 3.3 million years ago. There's no genes homo 3.3 million years ago. And what they're going to claim here is that the, and we'll get there, but they're gonna claim that the, the, the stone tools assigned to homo habilis actually belong to homo sapiens because homo habilis is just another ape, like, which by the way, like they're, they're saying this guy is just another ape quote unquote, this thing looks way more similar to, to Homo sapiens than it does to even Australopithecus, let alone Miocene apes. If, um, a, if a creationist found that skull in Kansas, they would they assume think, they'd that's call it a pygmy. pygmy. They'd call it a pygmy. That's what they would do. Um, already, you've got creationists that look at Lucy's pelvis and say, oh, it's, it's the pelvis of a pygmy human, right? And then the other ones say, actually, the pelvis is reconstructed wrong. They, they can't even agree on the reasons why it's not a hominin, a transitional hominin, which I think is quite telling. Um, habilis, homo habilis, homo rudolfensis, uh, which is another hominin, like you're, you're going to find this guy, right? And tell me that this guy is just another ape, which is, it's no, no creationist does this. Um, and that's why they don't show the skulls. Like you'll notice for this entire presentation with homo habilis, we don't look at the skulls. They obfuscate and talk about these stone huts that, again, we're going to get to. So it's remarkably frustrating. The best set they have is a small collection of bones they refer to as the official type specimen. It was found over a widely excavated area. It was mixed with bones from species from the cow, the pig, the horse, and the tortoise families, and a few catfish and birds. This defining specimen consists of a jawbone with 13 teeth, a molar, a couple of skull fragments, and 21 finger, hand, and wrist bones. How did they know all these bones were from the same Homo habilis creature? Well, it went through some uh, revisions. They later found out that six of the 21 finger bones did not belong, and one of the finger bones was a vertebral fragment. Two others belonged to a monkey. Originally, they uh, described the hand as human, and because it looked like it had precise grasping abilities, they called it homo habilis, which means handyman. Again, we're only going to talk about this assemblage. They, they won't bring up any other homo habilis remains from other locations. They just don't want to talk about it. Um, yeah, homo habilis is one of the earlier hominins that we, that we find, actually, once we start looking for hominins in East Africa. It's pretty old. Like it was the leakies in like the sixties and the seventies that were the ones that, that found homo habilis and that named homo habilis. And eventually I have to when tell you, yeah. I, I, I got a chance to, to uh, talk with Richard Leakey Ugh. about this. So I, th I think it was KNMR 1470. There was some, something yeah. that was brought up about that. I think that's what it was. And there was, I was able to see all of the other quote mining that these creationists were doing and and show what the what was really said or what was the next sentence that 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 shows the lie to what they just told me. But the one thing I couldn't find was the was the leaky quote. So I wrote to Richard Leakey to find out about this. And his response, I, I loved it. it. That I got a response from Richard Leakey was was itself amusing. But but the way he described these uh he described creationists as dishonest operators of astonishing stupidity. <laughs> hits him with both he's like he's like yes they are being dishonest but they're also incompetent he's like double <laughs> yeah i mean 
the, the, what's remarkable about this is that when, when Christians are talking about homo habilis, because it's such an old hominin, what they tend to do is they tend to go back to the original like notes that were first being published when these bones were being pulled up by the dozen from the ground. And and leakies, the leakies, like they did with the late tooly footprints, you know, they're pulling, pulling up this stuff that does look remarkably human. And they'll say, oh, like this, this looks pretty human. And then Christians will be like, see, that means it was a human. And then you, if you take the next sentence, as you said, you go down and you look in these publications, they'll then go on to talk about, no, but it, it does have distinguishing characteristics. I mean, Homo habilis was assigned to genus Homo because of the tool use, right? It was one of the first hominins associated with tools. The reason why Kimball wrote Australopithecus to, to Homo, the transition that wasn't, is because we have tools associated with Australopithecus earlier in time, which is fascinating. And what it means that it what it means is that one of the defining characteristics that was initially used to differentiate humans from everything else and genus Homo from everything else isn't actually a distinguishing characteristic at all. It, it's something that has been ubiquitous in our lineage for quite some time, and not even just ours, right? Paper came out this year that assigned or that um, showed an association at a, at, a, at a site between Paranthropus and stone tools. So it might not even be limited to our lineage, right? It might be that numerous different hominins being hominins in different ways were utilizing tools. Um, but they can't have that, right? Because <laughs> that, that ruins the human exceptionalism. They suspected that it was a slightly larger brained early human that made the thousands of stone tools found in the same area. Interesting. Do they know whether the stone tools they found near the fossils were used by Homo habilis or if they were used on Homo habilis by humans? They don't know. Uh, in the same archeological bed, several sites were found where thousands of animals of different kinds were butchered and eaten, along with thousands of stone tools of many varieties. Okay, so first and foremost, how do we know if the stone tools are being used on something or by something when the other remains at the site have stone tool cut marks on them and you don't find any on the cut any of the on the individuals proposed to have used them. So when you find homo habilis in stone tools, what do you do? You look at homo habilis, does it have any cut marks on it? No. Do the other animals at the site have cut marks on them? Yes, that means that the only guy capable of using tools found at the site was probably using the stone tools on the organisms that do have cut marks on them, processing them, processing them, butchering them, etc. That it's like the easiest kind of association you can make. They also found the rock foundation on a 12 foot circular hut nearby, also in the same archeological bed. And they described this circular stone foundation as having a striking similarity to the shelters made by present day nomadic people in the same area today. You'll notice that what they say is a circular hut nearby. So we're talking about the distance between Olduvai Gorge and Hyrax Hill. Hyrax Hill is where they find these, these stone huts. That's that's everything that I could find on them is that all of these, these stone huts found by Mary Leakey, who they later say is the one who did the work on these circular structures that she did her work at Hyrax Hill. That's where they're from. Now, I just want well, to... If it's, a, wanna, different, if it's oh, a different location and it's a different elevation, stratigraphically, then it's not the same thing. And if the, the creationists are, are, are perfectly fine with saying that it is the same thing because it suits their purpose, but if a scientist were to say that they were the same thing, that would be fraudulent. Why is it only a lie if the scientists do it? Why is it never a lie when the creationists do it? Well, I, I, I want to hit you with the punchline here, Aaron, because if you'll remember in the last video, what they said was that <laughs> what they said was that Australopithecus can't be associated with the Laetoli footprints because Lucy is too far away from the Laetoli footprints. They're they're too far from each other. Never mind the fact that Australopithecus is not found just at the site with Lucy. It's found as a species all over the place and very near the late Tolly footprint. So like, that's an aside. But their argument is that they're too far from each other. That's why they can't be associated. You want to know how far away Hyrax Hill is, where this, this stone structure is from the, the OH7 type specimen? It's an eight-hour drive. <laughs> it's an eight-hour <laughs> drive by car. <laughs> It's an eight hour drive. I just pulled it up. It's eight hours and five minutes. It is 448.6 kilometers away. Nearby, nearby. You've got to be kidding me. 
They just throw it in there. Like as a, as a little aside, thinking no one will notice. I always notice because I always check because they're always conning you every single time. I also heard they found the stone circle in a layer beneath the typeset bones for Homo habilis. Is this the case? Yes. So wouldn't this mean that whoever was there working with tools and making huts was on the scene before Homo habilis even showed up on the fossil record? Well, I guess it would. Now, here's the important bit. You know those stone circles? They were initially um, excavated by Mary Leakey in the 1930s, as I alluded to, to earlier. Now, wouldn't you know it, work was done later on these, on these stone circles um, by, I think it's Sutton et al. in uh, 1987. Sutton et al. in 1987. Um, yeah, he radiocarbon dated some of the charcoal found at this site. They're 200 years old. They're from the Iron Age. The stone circles are from the Iron Age, which is why I thought to myself, it's quite strange, you know, that they're saying, oh, you know, these stone circles, they're found in a layer below Homo habilis nearby. Eight and a half hours away nearby, huh? Same layer, huh? I couldn't find anything on these things being in the same layer or even being close to each other, stratigraphically speaking, which makes sense given they're from the Iron Age right? By radiometric dating, they're found to be in the Iron Age. And remember, for those of you out here who are like, oh, creationists don't accept uh, radiometric dating, therefore you can't use this argument against them. They accept it relatively speaking. They accept radiometric dating to place things relative to one another as something being older than the other thing. And these circles are found to be younger than Homo habilis by radiometric dating. So you can't associate them by anybody's worldview or by conventional science and conventionally scientific means. So their argument doesn't even work internally. So like they just, they just say this stuff. And like I said at the beginning, it was not so easy. Just, just a clarification, though, when it's talking about a lower level. So we're talking about it, generally when we're, we're talking about these kind of things, it's not like a lot of people will think that, that they're they're using like in Jurassic Park, you know, where they have the, the, the sonic thing that reads out where the fossil is and they dig down to it. What generally happens, what usually happens, these kind of things is you're looking for stuff on the surface. So whatever has eroded on the surface. So there's different layers of erosion. And so some group go to an area where there's a low, uh, uh, a low area. So, so it's going to be more eroded. And then they put circle, stones in a circle and build a fire 200 years ago. And that's what they're talking about by a lower level. That That is my understanding because I can't find anything in Mary Leakey's initial publication in the 1930s that's saying, like, she doesn't even talk about habilis, right? Like, I, I don't understand where the connection was drawn. I think you're right. I my, my understanding is that they were like, they're both on the surface, therefore same layer. Um, but again, I mean... This is what they do. They're taking publications from the 1930s that are very difficult for the average person to track down. If I didn't have my university association, I couldn't get a hold of it, right? Like they're, they're, the whole point is that you can't double check them. Um, but Sutton goes in depth in 1987 of, of the dating of these circles. They're not associated with Homo habilis, not even close, not even close, not even close temporally and not even close geographically. So like, this is just, it's just nonsense again. So how does using this creature support the evolutionary theory? It seems backwards to me. Yes, I see what you mean. I mean, it seems out of order compared to what we would expect. It's a good point. Because you're a docent doesn't mean you're a professor. That's the one realistic thing about this. I mean, not everybody who works in a museum is going to know, is, gonna, is certainly going to have your kind of a background on this. Very well, few do. Well, and this is this is incredibly sneaky, right? What they've done here, because if that was true, if you could actually show uh, categorically constructed stone monuments as being earlier than any finding of Homo habilis, that would be a very interesting point to make. That would be a good point in the sense that it would merit further investigation. But that's not what they found. It's simply not. It's like brutally untrue. You see what I mean? So like, yeah, it, categorically, it's a good point, just like it would be a good point if we found a rabbit side by side with a trilobite, right? Like that would be a good point, except that's never happened. It's not even close, right? Like it, 
it's just a lie, right? <laughs> like, I mean, there's not much else to say except like you, yeah, it'd be a good point in fa in fantasy world, right? Like I've got these books that I've, I've been uh, reading through for, for a, um, a, a video series. They're called The Truth Chronicles. They're a, a comic book by a young earth creationist about a bunch of kids that go back in time and prove young earth creationism to be true. And over and over again in their adventures, right, where they travel back in time and they're like, oh, you see how we're supposed to be 65 million years ago, but the constellations look the same as they do now? That's proof that we're actually only 6,000 years ago and that, you know, old Earth is, is nonsense. And it's like, well, yeah, if you could build a time machine and show that to be the case, that would be really good support for young Earth creationism because you created a fantasy world where young Earth creationism is true. But that, that's not... Like you're you're making up evidence and then saying it supports your claim. Of course, it's going to be a good point, um, but like you, that's not how the world works, right? Like if I could I could walk around the corner and say I built a time machine and and went back in time and and showed that um, actually the the Nordic gods were legitimate and are responsible for the current orientation of the continents. And it's like yeah, if I actually went back in time and shown that to be the case, that would be good support for for Nordic religions, but. No one's done that because time machines aren't real. <laughs> like, I don't know what From else. From my perspective, I, I was always of the mind that if that if you if we built a time machine or just convinced a creationist that we built a time machine, even if it's not a real time machine, if you convinced them that it is a time machine, they wouldn't get in it. Well, the time something would have to be wrong, right? Like we would have to be wrong. The the time machine physics would have to be wrong even if they got back even if they got in the time machine and they went back and showed that you know, the earth is in fact very ancient and young earth creationism is nonsense and blah, blah 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 something would be a mess it would be a trick by satan or something along those lines like i i asked i asked a um a young earth creationist years ago like what set me on this course was i, I had a co-worker who was a young earth creationist and we talked all the time at work about young earth creationism and so we started having coffee and i would talk to him about it and say, this is why we basically argue once a month over coffee. And I asked him one time, I was like, okay, like, let's say the Bible said something categorically false, like that is knowably untrue. And, and the example that I presented was <clears throat> the one, I, I forget where it is, but where it says pi is three, right? Pi is not three. We know pi is not three. Um, and I attribute that to human error because humans are humans, but in his view, you know, the, the Bible is perfect in, in every way. And, and he does like the literalist inerrancy thing. So I, I used a hypothetical. I was like, look, well, what if what if the Bible said like the, the sky is pink, like the, or, you know, or green or something like that, something categorically false that we can show to be the case. And he said, well, I would assume that we had something wrong. You see what I mean? Like we've done something wrong. The, the Bible is in and of itself accurate the way it is, but we've we've screwed something up. I'm pretty sure I already told you that, that one minister said that if the Bible said two, two, two plus two equals five, that he would believe it. Yeah. William yeah. Jennings Bryan said that if jo if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, he would believe it. It doesn't right. matter how ridiculous it is. It doesn't matter if there's proof that it's not true. They're going to believe it anyway. Right. And it, what, what set me on this course? I, I was, well, I, I was already on this course, but I mean, I, I talked to, to, to let me know the dishonesty of it. We talked about a time machine with this creationist way back in the day. And, and, and I said, what if you had the time machine and you were able to find Jesus, which I don't think is possible, but let's say you can. Uh, you find Jesus, you watch his crucifixion, assuming that happened, because I'm not sure it did. And then you see his body put in a tomb with a bunch of other people, not a private tomb, but you just put in a tomb with a bunch of other people. And you, and you have a chance through this time machine, you can watch his body lie there and rot for a week. Would that change your mind? And she said that she hoped that her faith would be strong enough to keep believing even when her eyes say otherwise. So it doesn't matter if you have proof. No amount of proof is ever going to change their minds. Right. And and that's just, that's that's such a, a sad way to be, I think, right? Like that's that's so... That's a very depressing mindset to have, uh, to, to be closed off to the world around you. I mean, what do you say to that? You, I mean, what, what did you say to that? you just like, I, I'm out of here. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> I had to screenshot it, and I made a video where that, that 
that comment was included, along with some others that I was getting on ChristianForums.com back in the day, where people said that you know, we don't respond to facts. We, we respond to faith, which means they're going to believe what they want to believe, and it doesn't matter what the truth oh, is. Yeah, so speaking of this, just because, like, again, a lot of what they say from here on out in this video is, like, the same thing. We won't have to stop very much. But in that same vein, I uh, you know Raw Matt, right? Uh, don't raw mat. Yes. Raw mat. Yeah. You know, raw mat. So I have a clip of raw mat uh, saying that he likes to take the hard debates. He likes to take the debates where all the evidence is against him. Right. And he says that as like a positive thing, but like, he's like, yeah, I like the debates where all the evidence is against me. And it's like, this is the truest thing you've ever said, right. <laughs> that all the evidence is against you. Um, and it's quite telling. I think that it's like, you, you're willing to fight against fact and that is, again, like it's it's such a depressing mindset to have. That must be very exhausting. One of their strategies is to simply poke holes in whatever the scientific position is, and not offer their own theory. Oh, yeah. Not, yeah, not, they don't. Yeah, they don't offer their own. They, they don't. They don't have a model. It's whatever science can't explain that becomes evidence of magic, which they well, don't no. call magic, but it's magic. Well, and I don't blame them for that. I don't blame them one bit because when they do try to make models, they get absolutely bodied by the most basic laws of physics. I mean, their flood models are absolute. They're, it's a house of cards. And it's like a house of cards with like two cards leaning against each other. There's not even much to it. Um, they can't create their own model. Their own model cannot exist, you know, and and. I so I'm like I get it. Like I get why they want to spend all day poking holes in evolution, as if finding a, a, an unanswered. And by the way, for those of you out there, you know, listening, right? Like when I say poke holes, and when Aaron says poke holes, we're not even talking about hole poking. We're talking about unanswered questions. They think that that is a flaw. Having an incomplete body of knowledge is a strike against the body of knowledge. Okay, well then, I guess let's just go back to sitting around in caves and clacking rocks together because everything about the exploration of the world around us is bogus, if that's the case. It goes back to the presuppositionalist assumption that you can't know anything unless you know everything. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and you can't argue with a presupp person. Like, they, they're not someone, they're not reasonable. You can't, there's nothing to be said so, there. So the like, argument that I got, the argument that I got is that you, you know, and you, you, you can't know everything unless you, you can't know anything unless you know everything, or you know someone who knows everything. I'm like, ah, but if you yourself don't know everything, then you don't know anything by your logic. That means you don't even know if you know someone who knows everything. There you go. I mean, the, the way I put it is, is like, you know, I was talking, I did a video on Jason Lyle's a pre-supper, right? And he's like, oh, you have to presuppose you know, the young earth creationist version of God in order to know anything at all. And it's like, well, I'm just doing your presuppositions, but one less. I just, I presuppose, you presuppose God, thus you can trust your senses. I just presuppose that I can trust my senses. Like my, I've just got one less presupposition than you do, which in the world of parsimony is ideal. <laughs> you want to reduce your assumptions, not increase them. Could you please go back to the slide showing the Stone Hut Foundation they found? Sure. What types of animal bones are shown scattered all around the hut? Well, there are bones from species in the croc, crow, hippo, elephant, horse, tortoise, and pig families. How many bones did they find outside the hut area? It looks like 348. And how many were found inside the Hut Foundation? Only 11 small fragments, mostly toes and teeth. And what about the leftover rock pieces that get chipped off when they're making tools called debitage? Debitage. Was that found mostly inside or outside of the Hut Foundation? Well, this slide shows that they found 50 pieces of debitage and 48 of 50 were found outside the Stone Hut Foundation. You've got to be kidding me. Do you, like, what? what is the argument being made here? I don't understand. Like, I genuinely don't understand what they're trying to say. It seems that they're they're trying to associate these huts, which are, which are not associated with Homo habilis. They're trying to associate them with Homo habilis. And the, the number of, of animals outside the huts, I guess, were not eaten near the huts or were eaten before there was huts built there? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. They're just looking for any uncertainty that they can think of. 
I mean, to me, that's what it seemed like, right? To me, it seemed like they're trying to say that there there is any level of we're not sure here to kind of shoehorn in that it must have been humans, like anatomically modern humans who are making the huts and I guess butchering Homo habilis. Like, yeah, so any modern, any modern anatomical human bones that were found in this area that are that also date to the same time period or or are no, no, not a one. Yeah, I mean, and I'm trying to like, I'm trying to back up here just so I can see for myself because, like, I don't think, like, I, I don't know this. I don't know this for certain. But what it looks like to me is that they're they're flipping back and forth. Yeah. Okay. It looks to me like they're flipping back and forth between sites here. Like it looks yep. to me like they're flipping back and forth between the site the stone hut site and the homo habilis, the OH7 site. Yeah, they're conflating them. Yeah, which is not something that you can they're do. They're conflating the eight and a half hour drive. They're conflating the eight and a half hour drive. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, two and, million years ago, 200 years ago, what's the difference? Yeah, what's the difference? Who who <laughs> Who is to say? Uh, let me do something really quick though. I just wanna, I just wanna double check something. I want to, while we're here, report on excavations. Okay, this is leaky. I want to make sure that we are talking about difference. Like, I just want to be sure here. Richard Leakey came to an American humanist, or he was supposed to be at an American humanist convention in San Diego some years ago. And I had no wherewithal to, to be a part of that at all but I, I drummed up the money for a flight. I didn't, I couldn't afford a room, but I decided if necessary, I was going to sleep on the beach. I just wanted to attend this conference to meet the man. And right. as, as it happened, somebody had, somebody had rented a bungalow that they weren't using. So they let me have it for the night. So, I mean, I, it worked out pretty well. Leaky himself never showed up. So I never health issues and I never got to meet him. Sorry to say. But I was yeah. I was really glad that I managed to attend that really swanky conference nonetheless. Yeah, I um Okay. I'm just <laughs> Okay. So it looks like Aaron it looks like Leaky herself in 1943 also goes back to talking about Hyrax Hill, this place with the circle, that they cite on their website as what they're talking about. So if they're talking about something else, then they didn't cite their sources very well and they should put it in the video, what they're actually talking about here. So the best of my understanding, they're comparing- You OH want citations from creationist propaganda? I know, I, I know, I, I know. My expectations are very high, but they want to play with the big boys. So I'm putting my expectations with the big boys, you know? Um, it sounds to me like they're conflating OH7's location with the stone circle. So, so Olduvai Gorge's location with Hyrax Hill, again, eight and a half hours apart from one another. Leakey in 37 talked about that as being quite ancient, the, the stone circle. But then, as I said, Sutton in, 18, in uh, 1987 said, no, it's Iron Age. And I found here, 1943, Leakey's report, Mary Leakey's report on it, where she also says it's Iron Age. This is her paper on it, the actual location. I control F for homo habilis, nothing. I control F for homo, nothing. She's saying there's only humans there. So why are we talking about these two locations as if they are as if they are in the same spot? What 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 is going on here? Like to me, it sounds like they don't even know what they're talking about. If well, someone is coming to the veteran, let me know. Yeah, like it, this is this is actually kind of nuts. The, the way that they argue, remember, they have absolute certainty with zero evidence. No evidence at all. They don't want evidence. They don't care. They don't have, it, it doesn't matter how much evidence there is to the contrary. They're going to keep believing what they want to believe. But we have to have all the evidence and it all has to be rock solid. It all has to be absolute proof. And even when it is absolute proof, two plus two does not equal five. For example, you have the time machine, you watch Jesus's body rot. Even when you have the proof, it still doesn't matter. That's the double standard. That's the extreme game that they're playing here. Yeah, I mean, from my, from my understanding here, 
there's no homo habilis at the site with the stone circle. That's that's my understanding here. So the, the whole thing where they're talking about the bones inside and outside the hut is complete gibberish because you're not even talking about a site where homo habilis is present. I think, I think you're right. I think the only through line here is this layer that they're found in, which is the surface. I think that's what's going on. But again, I'm not, I'm not positive. So if I'm, you know, I'm leaving room here, maybe, maybe the argument is more intelligible, but if it is, I can't figure out what it is. So just to be clear, they found a 12 foot stone hut foundation below Homo habilis bones with almost all discards from tool making outside the hut. And they also found over 300 bones from eight different types of butchered animals outside the hut. And the paleo experts who discovered the site said it was similar to how nomadic people still live, even today. Okay, so there. Th thank you for this summary. This is very helpful. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Paleo experts are not saying that, 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 like, she's drawing conclusions that the paleo experts aren't even drawing. Leakey in 1943 says that this is an Iron Age hut. It is not associated with Homo habilis. So what is, why are they even talking about them in the same sentence? These are two completely different sites. Not to mention the fact that, again, we can associate the stone tools with Homo habilis. One, because they're more basal than the later stone tools that are attributed to later hominins like Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. They're even more basal than what we see in early Homo erectus. And two, the other animal bones have cut marks on them while Homo habilis does not. So we know that that's the butcher versus the butcheries. It's a really simple one-to-one. -one. And of course, we find Homo habilis at other locations as well. So like, what are they doing? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> it seems quite obvious that humans were living here not apes. Homo habilis, handy man, is in the genus Homo, which means man. Homo is human. Every species within the genus Homo is human. But then humans are a subset of apes. It's kind of like not all birds are ducks, but all ducks are birds. Same sort of thing. Not all apes are human, but all humans are apes. Well, that line of thinking would agree with Mary Leakey. Uh, she was the lead paleo expert over the site. And she said that the two key giveaways that the Stone Hut Foundation was an artificial, like a man-made site, were the six mounds of heaped rocks, um, evidently for support poles, and the disproportionate uh, number of bones and tools they found outside the hut, not inside, along with the two-foot buffer around the circle, without a lot of tools or bones. Again. She published in 43 that these are Iron Age huts. Like, you would agree with Mary Leakey in the 1930s, and then you and her would both be wrong as compared to her in 1943. Not even, not even a decade later. She would disagree with you. So, like, ah, this is so frustrating. Um, she said it was a, a lot like the one that people in the same area build today. Does this not also feel like a little racist to you, Aaron? That like they're comparing, like they're they're trying to say that these Iron Age monuments of what they are saying is basically archaic Homo sapiens. That's what they're arguing for. That it's similar to what modern hunter gatherers do. I've met modern hunter gatherers. They don't make like what's being made here at this site in this Iron Age area. They're they're hunter gatherers. They're nomadic, so they're moving from spot to spot. They don't build stone monuments, but. It feels a little, uh, it's a little suspicious to me that they're doing the thing where they're like, yeah, these ancient, these ancient hominin sites, which they're proposing that this is very old and potentially made by earlier versions of humanity, even if they were homo sapiens, um, is similar to what modern hunter-gatherers are doing. That's very, uh, that feels condescending to me. Yeah, it's like that when today somebody's trying to accuse me of being racist for being an evolutionist, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and says the Democratic Party was started by the by the KKK. And I'm like, well, in the 1930s, many of the people who were in the Democratic Party were in fact Klansmen, but due to the Southern strategy, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party has switched positions on a lot of issues uh, over the course of the 1960s. So while it is true that 
many, you know, the Democrats were, were, were the, the Klan tended to be Democrats in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Every Klansman is a Republican now. And every Klansman is also a Christian and a creationist as well. So don't accuse me of being racist when the Klan are the Christian creationists. And don't use the Klan against me. They're your fault, not me. Well, and if memory serves, they don't like evolution because it it unites humans as a single species, as a single group. Uh, and they don't want to be related to uh, brown people, <laughs> evidently. So that's why. And, and, you know, Ken Ham tries really hard these days. He likes to do the whole one one race, one blood. Evolution is bad and racist, and we are not. Cool. By using Jeffrey Tompkins' methods, you're a guy who you've got publishing in your journal. Two populations of humans from Japan versus versus mainland China are like 79 to 87% similar to one another using Tomkins's methods, which is less similar, by the way, than domestic cats are to lions by Tomkins's method. So, you know, it, you want to call us racist. That's, and, you know, they do the same thing with the, um, they, uh, they do the same thing with like the um, March of Progress type things where they're like, why does it go from being black to being white? And it's like, usually because they're, end, usually they end it with Neanderthals, which ostensibly, was very fair skinned in a lot of places because they lived far to the north. Skin is just a polygenic adaptation to where you live in, re in relation to the equator. Um, the best support well, for I'd... oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, what well, would no that that that's fine. I just I, I, there's some geneticists that I've, that I've had I've had chance to talk to, like Ken Miller, for example, and 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 some of these people are explaining that white skin is itself a mutation, as is black skin. So that and I'm, I'm putting this in very simple terms so that, you know, brown is the standard. And then yeah. you have this one mutation that occurs in Europeans and Asians where they become very light skinned. And that that required a mutation to make us whiter than the norm. Whereas uh, it, in sub-Saharan Africa and also in India and in Sri Lanka, you know, you have a different mutation in both of those locations that produced very dark skin, different, different in Africa than in India, but it's, yeah. these are different mutations that darken the skin over what the norm was. Yeah. I mean, humans, humans are variable because we, we live in different locations and lived in different locations for hundreds of thousands of years. That's all it is. It's just that humans have super low genetic diversity because we're really, really similar to one another. Like any two humans, no matter where you pull them from, are going to be more similar to one another. Actually, let's, let me put it this way. The two most disparate humans on the planet are going to be more similar than any given two chimpanzees. Like it, we are just remarkably similar. Race is, is not like a biological entity at least as we utilize it today, it's, it simply isn't. Um, now I've heard you say that before, but what you're referring to is the four recognized genetic categories of chimpanzees, right? Uh, uh, no, I think it's actually even, even within that group, even within like Pantroglodytes troglodytes or Pantroglodytes virus or Pantroglodytes schwenkfurthii, even within those groups, they're still more genetically diverse than the two most disparate humans. Interesting. I'm, I'm fairly certain that's the case because I had to look this up for a video a while back. Um, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure. Um, I'll look it up okay. and, and stick the paper in the comments or clarify it in the comments. Thank you. Can you please tell me about the types of stone tools they found at the site where the Hutt Foundation was found? They found choppers, polyhedrons, discoids, and many small tools like scrapers, burns and flakes. Where did they get the materials to make the stone tools? And did they just use any kind of rock? Actually, they mostly used uh, a rock called quartzite um, because it can be flaked to a razor-like edge. Uh, that type of rock was not found in the area. They had to quarry it from a location miles away and bring it to where they used it to butcher the animals. What steps would need to be taken to turn this quartzite rock into the tools they found, these animals butchering sites? I mean, is it easy to do? Actually, it's uh, really difficult to do, and there are several steps that have to be taken. Well, first, you've got to have the right kinds of rocks, uh, like the quartzite they found, because it can be flaked and shaped into sharp handheld tools for animal butchering. Then you have to shape the rock using percussion or pressure tools, like uh, pointed hammer stones or cylindrical hammers, um, like long bones. Most of the stone tools 
found were sized to be held in the hand for processing the meat off of animals, like um, a primitive slaughterhouse. Uh, so the types of stone tools that Homo habilis made were old one stone tools. These are like pretty low grade on our lithic scale here. They're better than Lamequi tools, but they're not up there with what we would even see in Homo erectus with some of the Acheulean, or sorry, Acheulean, uh, Mousterian tools that would come later. So like, you can see that the way they tried to present this was that these are like these super advanced stone tools that only modern humans were capable of utilizing. No, they're choppers, right? Like you, you take two rocks and bang them together, you get a nice sharp end on one and you've got a hand ax. I mean, they're hard to make for modern humans because we're not trained in it. But like these, these are like pretty simple napping techniques if napping is a part of your culture, like napping um, stone tools is. So like, I, I think it's kind of funny that they're trying to make bringing quartzite from another area back to their home base, which is something that Homo habilis is characterized as doing, having sort of a, a home area. And you'll notice again, we've swapped back. We're, on, we're no longer talking about that Iron Age site. We're talking about the OH7 site again, because we're talking about the types of stone tools that Homo habilis made. It's not out of character for them to have gone to another location and bring a stone tool back and then, and then nap it to the degree that they want to nap it and then butcher animals with it. This isn't like a super complicated process. Chimpanzees bring rocks from other locations to where their anvil is located and use them to crack nuts because they have specific types of rocks that they like to utilize. If a chimp can do it today, I'm pretty sure Homo habilis could do it in the past. One more thing. Didn't the leakies, the very scientists who discovered Homo habilis, find fossil evidence that led them to believe that Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus all lived at the same time? How is one supposed to evolve into the other if fossil evidence points to them living at the same time? Well, actually, they did say that, and their position perplexed many evolutionary scientists, and many do not agree with them. But I respect their opinion because their family spent more years excavating and mapping the areas where these early fossils were found than anyone else did. That sounds a lot like nomadic tribes of humans were setting up camp, making specialized hand tools using special rocks found miles away, and butchering and eating animals, including apes, just like people have been doing for a long time. Okay, look, you made your point about Homo habilis. So the point about Homo habilis is that we took a site that is associated with modern humans from the Iron Age, and we dishonestly conflated that with another site eight and a half hours drive away at a, at a different level that, that was not by the original site was not uh, associated with Homo habilis at all. Uh, and we said that since uh, we, we're just going to ignore that, that chimpanzees can do this, so we're going to pretend that only people can do what we've seen chimpanzees do. And so what? Yeah, I mean, and and not only that, but we're going to ignore the actual material that we have from the specimen. You'll notice in all the previous episodes, they were perfectly keen to talk about the morphology of the individual finds. We didn't even touch morphology. We didn't even scrape the surface with it. And the reason is because, again, it's problematic. It's transitional. We didn't touch the skulls. We didn't touch the postcrania. We didn't touch the foot, which is like, the reason they didn't touch the foot is because the foot is for all intents and purposes, a small version of an anatomically modern human, right? There, there are certain uh, derived characteristics and basal characteristics unique to it, as there are to the minutia of a lot of these. But if they looked at the picture of the, the Homo habilis, I think it's uh, it's OH something, one of the, uh, the, the old of my foot assigned to Homo habilis, they'd be like, it's a pygmy human's foot because it's got the inline toe and the three arches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they can't talk about the foot and they can't talk about the skull and they can't talk about the hand because as you heard at the end there, they want to characterize Homo habilis as just an ape. So they can't talk about the morphology because it's too transitional. Um, then they also talk about the contemporaneity there at the end. To my understanding, like and you, you heard him say like, oh, the, this is a contentious opinion that Australopithecus Homo habilis and Homo erectus all lived contemporaneously together at the same site. Yeah, because no one says that, right? Homo habilis and Australopithecus overlap chronologically. Homo habilis and Homo erectus overlap chronologically. And very late Australopithecus, specifically, um, <coughs> and very late Australopithecus, specifically Australopithecus sediba in South Africa, potentially overlaps with material for dremelin, which is very primitive Homo erectus. But we do not have an overlap of all three species at one site anywhere in Africa, as far as I know. So 
that also and, and they kind of cop to that at the end there don't they by being like oh this is this opinion isn't held by everybody but i respect the leaky's opinion because they were a family that worked at this for a super long time like my understanding as well is and i don't know the leaky's particular work like like the back of my hand but my understanding is that even the leaky's didn't hold to this at the end of, of their sort of tenure at the site um i could be wrong on that but i don't think meve was like publishing on that and she's only recently stopped being in the field hold on Okay, and, and the entire time you were talking, the dog has been like, just, I can't have professionalism in my life. You're not allowed. <laughs> yeah, the long and short of this whole section is that it is yet again another bogus clip from, from this documentary. They don't actually talk about the, it's worse than the previous one because they don't even actually talk about it's worse than the previous one because they don't even talk about the find. They don't even talk about the hominin itself. They talk about erroneous connections that they have made that they're they're drawing on an earlier publication from an author that didn't even hold that opinion for five years in order to make their case from the 1930s, which is just about classic for creationists, although they're really pushing the boundary. Usually creationists are only 30 or 40 years out of date. In this case, they're almost 100 years out of date as far as an opinion that they're that they're holding here. So yeah, I'm, I'm unimpressed by this. I think it's interesting too, that they're going to Neanderthals next. Just, just skipping 2 million years of Homo erectus, it's fine. We don't need to talk about it. Um, and I think that's particularly fascinating because Homo erectus as a species represents the biggest jump in brain case size. So of course they have to skip it because it's too transitional. <laughs> And it doesn't matter, or they, they don't they don't understand how it can be that you can have this population that is spread like practically all across Africa, and that within <laughs> stop it, dog, and that within some population you have this new derivation as things emerge, right? And so that that this new this new emerging population does not somehow change all of the rest of the population. So now you have two groups living together and then you can have further derivations where maybe there's another population emerges from that group, like the paranthropines. And now you've got all three of them living at the same time when they've got individual species of paranthropines and different species of Australopithecines and they are all living at the same time. And now you have Homo habilis and he's living at the same time with Rudolfensis living at the same time. And eventually it's, from their lineage, one of those comes Homo erectus, and those three are living at the same time, not but with all of the others, because they don't understand that these are population level changes. They want no. there to be one person who's somehow like that, like that animation at the beginning of The Simpsons, where Homer walk, goes himself goes through all yeah, of these different the evolutionary stages. No, I know the one. Yeah, it's it's that's exactly it. I mean, we talked about this. It's a it's a perfect end cap, right, for this section because we talked about that at the beginning. They they've got this anagenetic idea about how things are supposed to go, and despite the fact that we have organisms overlapping today with organisms that in the very recent past have gone extinct, they think that that can't that can't happen moving backwards in time. That as soon as something new emerges, all the previous forms must go extinct. We don't see that with ring species today. We don't see that in the lab when we watch evolution actually happen. Why would we expect that to be the case in the past? Um, but overall, I think the point still needs to be made that overall we do see the emergence of the human condition and all its minutia emerge slowly over geologic time from prior forms in a mosaic fashion. That much cannot be denied. So 